shuffle about. Um, so what should you do? You should just basically, in a situation like that, we're trying to remove some kind of substance. You know. I want to basically press it because that's Not him. Rabbi, we have got a fill on the table. Rabbi, don't squeeze it. Um, we we, we, we lost course, most of that. There's a separate issue of if you put a liquid paint. Yeah. You keep Losing stopping me. and starting, Rabbi. Oh, gosh. Okay, one second. Is that better? Oh, what just happened there? Yeah, we, we just missed a lot of what you said. Okay, I'll try again. Right. So, sp so say you spill something thick on your table. I don't know. You've got a thick tomato soup or something you're having. Right, or I don't know, uh, uh, ratatouille or something like that. And you've spilled it on your white tablecloth, right? And you want to clean it up on Shabbos. So there's a few issues. One is you don't want to be um, squeezing, even though you don't want the liquid, nonetheless, you don't want to be squeezing all those vegetables. So if you, for example, took a knife and scraped it all onto a plate, you have to be careful not to press on it. Um, if you took a cloth to clean it up, you have to be careful that there isn't sufficient liquid in there that uh, you're going to end up squeezing the cloth out. And then you've got another problem. If you apply liquid to your tablecloth, you might be laundering it. So basically don't spill things. Um, Tell that to the children. Yeah, the adults are quite capable as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, usually by half dollar, we say, oh, the cloth stayed clean because we've had a plastic on. Oh, good. We can use it next week. And then I end up spilling grape juice on it half dollar time almost without fail. Um, so, yeah. Um, similarly, if you are, so you, you're washing a baby, you have to put some baby oil on, you're using a uh, flannel or something or a wipe even or anything like that. Um, you have to be careful not to squeeze it out. So baby wipes are an interesting thing. Um, huggies are quite moist. They're probably too moist. You take them out of the packet and you can feel very clever how they do it. I don't know how they do it, but you can feel the moisture on them. Um, other brands, the sensitive ones are not as moist. So I don't know if you recall, we said last week that the rule of thumb was something that has enough moisture on it that will basically drip off it is a problem. So for example, I don't know, let's say you, uh, I don't know, you know that you're going to need to, uh, I don't know, you've got some need for some cleansing of some kind. So you take a flannel before Shabbos and you put some warm water on it and you squeeze it out before Shabbos, so it's just slightly damp, not damp enough to actually emit any moisture. So that would be permitted for use on Shabbos. So I think I mentioned last week, let's say you've got your mop that you used there of Shabbos and it's almost dry, just got a little bit of liquid left on it, but it's not very wet and it wouldn't, like if you squeezed it, it wouldn't come out. It's literally just moist. So you could use that to mop the floor on Shabbos. What you can't do is apply enough liquid that you might squeeze it out, right? So baby wipes are an interesting thing and I suspect a lot of us don't, are not as careful as we should be. Really, what one should do is make sure to, or any kind of wipe, I don't know, moisturizing or cleansing, cleansing wipes, or, you know, any kind of wipe that you use. But I'm thinking baby wipes. Um, if they're too moist, it's a problem. If you take them out of the packet and they're dripping wet, it's a problem because you're going to end up squeezing out the, the moisture. Um, so the best thing probably is to use, like I said, the sensitive ones are a bit thicker and have less moisture. Or alternatively, leave the packet open for a little bit so they dry out slightly before Shabbos. These are things to be aware of, though. It's problematic. little ones are not drippy. Right, so they would be good, basically. Because <laughs> um, otherwise you're squeezing out the moisture. It's very simple, which you're not allowed to on Shabbos. Um, okay. What about hair? I think we may have touched on this. Yeah. You can't squeeze your hair, so you have to be very careful when you dry your dry your hair that you don't basically squeeze the water out of it, right? If you've got long hair, you kind of squeeze it with a towel, don't you, to get the water out? Yes. But you can't wash it on Shabbos anyway. No, but let's say I don't know, it got wet, you're in the rain, or you had to go to mikvah, which is allowed on Friday night, or you're in the rain somewhere, right? or someone spilled something, or uh, it's your beard, I don't know, you've got moisture in your beard. So whatever the situation is, to so be particularly careful about squeezing out hair, um, which is a, one reason not to wash oneself on Shabbos. You have to be careful in general for a person for any reason. Going to make this the obvious one. Um, 
it'd be if you have to dry your hair for any reason, the preferred method that most people use, and I assume that ladies use if they go to make on a Friday night, is to pat it very gently rather than to sort of rub it vigorously with a towel. Because the other problem is you can't pull hairs out on Shabbos. Because we said previously, you can't detach something that's growing, right? That's a malacha. So you can't pull hairs out on Shabbos. So if you use a rough towel, you can easily pull hair out as well. So basically, if you have to dry hair, or your dog, or your cat, or your baby's child's hair, look, what happens when your child gets, you know, sticky stuff in their hair, and you have to somehow wash it out on Shabbos? You know, you've got to do it. Um, first of all, you have to use cold water. They're going to love that. And secondly, you have to be very careful when you're drying it, basically. Um, Okay, it says that you can't squeeze honeycomb either. Do people squeeze honeycomb? I think that's what that is. To get the honey out? Or maybe not. Maybe it doesn't mean honeycomb. Maybe it means something else. Maybe I'm misunderstanding it. Maybe it's not that. It's something to do with honey. I'm not sure what that is. Okay, what about milking? Might you squeeze the cow's udders to get the milk out? Morning, Jeff. Right, when you, when you milk a cow, you're squeezing the udders to get the milk out. Is that allowed? So it comes under the malacha, the heading of dosh, of threshing, but it's a very, very big subject. Um, Is it not that you, you have to do it because of the comfort of the... Right, the so that's where the question comes in. The question comes in that it would be cruel to leave a cow unmilked if it doesn't have calves for 24 hours. So one would have to look into that. It's not an automatic no. I don't know exactly what they do in milk powders. I think they have automatic milking machines. Okay. Similarly, if a woman has to express, I believe it's different from actual breastfeeding. And also there are Shilas around expressing milk for the same reason, essentially squeezing out milk, even though it's not, not exactly the same, but it comes under this heading. Um, but you're right. The issue of milking cows is not, is not. So here's a classic example of Shabbos. You can't say that you can't milk your cow on Shabbos because you'll lose a day's milk. That's the price of keeping Shabbos. What you can say is that there's pain to the animal from not being milked. So you have to find ways to do it. Sorry? Yes, my wife, that's, no, I don't think the farmer does it. I think they have a machine. So I think the way they do it in Israel is, first of all, they have automatic milking machines anyway. I don't know exactly how it works, but the cow goes up to the machine. It basically, robot, robotics, all very clever, clips on and milks it. If you're on a small farm with one cow, you don't have that. Um, but I believe that if you do have to milk it on Shabbos, first of all, you probably try to find a non-Jew to do it. And secondly, you can't then use the milk. So the milk has to go to waste because it was milked on Shabbos, which is obviously a shame, but that's life. So it's a complex subject. If you happen to have a cow, we can look into the exact halacha. So it's something to be aware of milking on Shabbos. It's a problem of, um, of threshing as well. Um, there were, nowadays you can buy supervised milk, most places, or you can get it flown in or whatever. Um, that wasn't always the case. And there are many stories of people who went to places that were particular to get Halavisol milk that went down to local farm and sat and did their own milking, basically. Obviously, they didn't do it on Shabbos. Um, I know a guy who, um, actually, the husband <laughs> of the person that made the kids' bar mitzvah cakes, one second, called Joe Kay, a guy called Greg Kay. He used to walk Shabbos morning from Boreham Wood at five in the morning to somewhere in Hertfordshire to supervise the milking on one of the farms. So I'm guessing that the, they must have not used the milk in actual commercial sale, but it had to be done for the health of the animals. Iris. Yes. Oh, you were not you just waving. I thought you asked you a question. No. Oh, you're just waving, right? <laughs> you look like you were putting your hand up. Oh, no, you know, I waved at uh, Jeff and Brenda. <laughs> All right, okay. You know, if you go to an auction, you can end up buying something that way. <laughs> I don't go to auctions. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, you scratch your nose, you've spent a million pounds. Um, so, as is often the case with halacha, here we are talking about agriculture, because, of course, um, the original paradigm of a lot of these things was an agricultural economy. And now we sort of scratch our heads and think, I don't know, who milks cows? Well, kibbutzim do it. Right. So if you're a religious kibbutz, these questions become very, very relevant, as do questions around Teruma and the various ties and the Schmitter, which is coming up, I think, next year. These all become highly relevant in the agricultural economy. Um, type of economy most of us live in where people are lawyers and doctors and accountants and hairdressers and rabbis and I don't know what everyone else does. 
uh, and building managers and uh, what have you, property developers, um, we sort of a bit perplexed by all of this because it doesn't really touch our lives. But of course, um, it used to be that we're involved in agriculture and in certain societies that is still the case. Like I said, on Kibbutzim and Moshavim, they have to apply these laws. Um, when you learn in Brochas, the mission about, you know, somebody who's up a tree and saying Shema and Damning, you think who goes up a tree at five in the morning? Well, I don't know. If you're on a Kibbutzim, you have to pick bananas. I suppose you do. Um, so these things do come up. Um, Okay, what about make a snowman? Are you allowed to put snow together um, or ice? Um, so some say yes and some say no. Some say it's very much like squeezing um, because it's basically... Isn't it building want. as well? well? I don't know if you're building anything really. Well, if you make a snowball, I don't think that's the issue. You so say much. you build a snowman. It's, tem it's temporary. Does that count? No, there's a few issues. Probably not, because you don't intend it to be temporary. Well, if you throw a snowball at someone, I suppose. And um, there are a few potential issues. One potential issue is, um, is the squeezing. Another potential issue, which is an interesting area, um, is what's called noilad. It's not one of the, or molid, it's not one of the 39 malachas. But molid or noilad is something that comes into being that wasn't there previously on Shabbos. The classic example that's given is an egg that was laid on Shabbat or Yom Tov. Are you allowed to use it or do you have to wait till after Shabbos? Because it came into being on Shabbos. It wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. um, when the fax machine was invented, this was the original discussion about faxes, right? One minute your machine's empty, the next minute there's a piece of paper in there with some text. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that came into being on Shabbos that you're not, you, the, there, is a, a, there is a rule that you're not supposed to use? Um, so ice is an interesting one. Um, things changing state also is a big topic. Um, but there are those who say, that the issue with ice generally, and this could also apply if you put ice in a cup and just leave it to melt, is that the water is, a, is, is almost like a new thing because the water wasn't there before it was in the ice and suddenly the water's come out. So bottom line is I don't think you can, you can do snow sculptures or things like that on Shabbos for various possible reasons. Um, but, if you put uh, ice in the glass to drink... It, it... Yes, you can do that because interestingly, even if you say there's an issue with the water... The ice being converted to water, which previously didn't exist, changing state. Um, when you put it in a glass, of course, any water that comes out of it is basically immediately um, swallowed up by whatever's in there. If you take a glass of apple juice, um, the truth is, if you put ice in apple juice and you leave it long yeah. enough, it does taste slightly watery. Right. Right. You know, people forget this. When you get a fizzy drink, I don't know if anyone's noticed this. When you put ice in a fizzy drink, um, it kind of slightly kills the... The, the, the bubbles in there yeah. because you're put you're adding water essentially like you wouldn't add water to lemonade it tastes horrible so people forget that when you go to the cinema or whatever and you get a big cup of with loads of crushed ice in you know by the time it starts to melt it tastes very flat um but anyway in essence the any water that drips out of the ice but i do remember when i was in new york there were people that would make a point they would put their ice straight in the drink they wouldn't leave it on its own so these are things to be aware of so making snowman now we have said previously you know, it's an interesting topic. My kids sometimes, you know, one of the kids will do something on Shabbos they shouldn't do, and the other kids will say, oh, oh you have to tell them you can't do it. And some would say, look, you know, you have to know your audience. And, if, you know, if a three-year-old on Shabbos is playing in the snow, I don't know that you have to, uh, you know, uh, was I saw somewhere someone said that they told their kid that because they're misbehaving, they're grounded for a week, and the kid looks at them and says, we're in lockdown anyway. But uh, um, I don't know if you have to punish somebody over that. Um, it's something to be aware of. It's preferable not to do it. So adults certainly probably shouldn't be making snowmen and things like that. Um, and generally, you have to be careful with ice and things like that or frozen things um, because of the liquid that it might be like squeezing also, right? Even though it's not, it's changing state. Um, so one has to be careful with that as well. Um, okay, if you've got butter or something, it could be a question with spreading butter. You have to be careful how... You know, if you've got very hard butter and you sort of press it hard with a knife, you might be, again, you might squeeze out some liquid from it. So these are all things to be aware of. Um, we don't we don't look for extreme situations. So, uh, you know, if you literally, you know, if your butter was soft and there's no reason to think that your spreading is going to squeeze it, then you're allowed to do it. And the fact that there might be, you know, a tiny drop of liquid is not a serious problem. We had a salad over Shabbos that had some liquid in. Um, I thought very cleverly poured the liquid away thinking it was, from the uh, feta cheese or whatever and Bim said no it was the dressing so uh, <laughs> that's what you get for not spending enough time in the kitchen um but these are all things to be aware of so if you had we said previously you had vegetables and you have liquid that comes off and you have to be careful um morning lawrence oh it's gone 
Okay, he was here. <laughs> Um, we're going to pause in a couple of minutes. Um, just a couple of more things quickly with regards to this. Um, can you make ice on Shabbos? Right, just by the way. I um, don't know what the issue would be. Um, Is it because you would be preparing for after right, Shabbos? Right, good question. So that, what happens, obviously... Issue. Okay, so it depends how quickly ice is going to, in the old days, it took about 24 hours. Now freezers are faster and, you, could, you know, it can be pretty much frozen within, what, six hours, something like that. Um, so yeah, you can probably do it yeah aren't you changing a liquid into solid good question so is that a problem we're going to look at that that's that's a separate question which we will look at well you said in... about changing a solid into a liquid yes so the so problem it works yes the other way so around we... as well right so we said that there are some that say that's an issue um for some reason it seems people are more concerned with liquids coming out of solids than the other way around maybe because of the squeezing issue like when you put ice in the freezer to freeze, you don't have the squeezing issue. Uh, in general, just with regard to freezing, by the way, something to, to think about um, and changing state. So if, for example, Friday night, I don't know, you finished your soup um, and you've got quite a lot left in the pot and you're concerned, right? ideally you should put it in the freezer after Shabbos, especially since if you freeze it now, you're basically preparing for after Shabbos. You're not doing it for now. However, if you're concerned that something's going to go to waste or spoil, then you could definitely put it in the freezer so no one says you can't put ice cream back in the freezer right? if you have ice cream for shabbos lunch and you put it back in the freezer wait a minute the only reason you put it back in the freezer is so it doesn't melt but that's fine Does to it? avoid spoilage okay but i'm not sure certainly after shabbos lunch let's say seven <coughs> o'clock uh, say you have a long lunch and you finish or well, after suda let's say you have suda at seven o'clock you finish at eight o'clock and you've got some i don't know you serve cold meat and kugel and you've got some left you don't have to put it in the freezer at 8 p.m you could wait till shabbos goes out so aside from other issues, we've got the issue of preparing for after Shabbos, right? Simply taking things out of the freezer. Uh, you can't take something out to defrost on Shabbos morning for Saturday night, simply because you're preparing for after Shabbos, right? aside from any other issues. Just something to be mindful of generally, okay? So if, if, you, if you wouldn't, look, you're saying thing with putting things in the fridge, right? If after Shabbos lunch, you didn't put stuff back in the fridge, it would spoil, uh, even though you're not going to use it again. So no one says you have to leave it out. Put it in the fridge to avoid spoiling. You can freeze something to avoid spoiling. What you couldn't really do, ideally, is to freeze something Friday night or Shabbos morning for Sunday or Monday when you could just as easily do it after Shabbos. So you have to be a little bit honest about these things. The whole issue of preparing cuts across all malachas. You can have an act which is not a malacha in any way, shape or form, but because you're preparing for after Shabbos, you shouldn't do it also, right? You shouldn't say to people in shul that... Uh, Oh, would you like to come around for dinner tonight? Okay, great. Come around at 11 o'clock after Shabbos because you're preparing for after Shabbos, even though there's no prohibition of discussing times with people. Right? It's one that we all find hard to do because you see people on Shabbos and the natural, well, please God, we should see people on Shabbos too. And the natural temptation is to say, oh, uh, can I meet you at 10 o'clock tomorrow? What time is Noah having his lesson tomorrow? Or what time is the shear tomorrow? Any of these things. So there is a bit of a dispensation where there's a mitzvah involved for preparing for a mitzvah. For after Shabbos. If our conversation is about what time we're learning, or what time we're dabbling, or what time Julian's going to pick up Howard to go to the minion to make sure we have a minion, then there's a bit more of a dispensation. But in general, we're careful. So one of the issues with freezing and unfreezing things, defrosting things, besides for anything else, is the issue of preparing for after Shabbos. Okay, we're going to pause there for a couple of minutes. I'm just going to check my presentation. Rabbi, looking... Rabbi yeah. what was Hi. the word that you said, something that came into being on Shabbat? Right, what... Mo molid or nolad, like to be born. Missed that. Uh, I missed mo that. Molid or nolad, N-O-L-A-D, well, it's Hebrew. Molid, um, it's like the word yeled or yada, which means to give birth. So it's something that's come into being, yeah. something that's born, something that's new. Um, some people say that's a problem with electricity, by the way, because it sort of comes out of nowhere. It's magic. Um, there are other issues with that. The fax machine was the classic example. Moon. Yeah, the molad, right. Same thing, the birth of the moon. Absolutely. Leida. Tish, are you? May Leida, right? Nine of the months of childbirth. I think I may have mentioned before. I never saw it again. I wish I kept it. There was an old, old Haggadah like a it not hurts but it was something along those lines some you know, stunning i don't know a very english one and they obviously felt that the nine months of pregnancy in echad miyodeya was would offend the delicate young minds reading this haggadah so it said uh you know ten of the ten commandments nine of the jewish festivals and then it had a footnote 
Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, Hanukkah, Purim, Lagba, Omer, and Yom Hashoah, or something like that. Um, and it's the only time I've ever seen this. Absolutely hilarious, because they couldn't bring themselves to say nine of the months of childbirth. Uh, but Leida is the word there. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to pause for just a minute or two. I'm going to go put my kettle on quickly. I'll leave everything open and we'll be back for some passion in about two minutes. Um, if you saw my spoiler, today we're going to talk about Mr. Spock for any Star Trek fans. I know that fans. one. I I'm know sure that you do. one. All right, don't spoil it yet. Connection. Don't spoil it yet. Don't spoil it yet. Okay, back in a minute. Julian? Julian. Yeah? He's just going to put the kettle on. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, it'll suit you wearing the kettle. Did you get my email? Yes. Um, I'll be in a Good. I wasn't certain whether it went through. Kiss, please, Jeff. Sorry? I wasn't certain whether it went through, so... Yeah. No, I, I got the email after I got the WhatsApp. Oh, oh that okay. was probably why. Yeah. Yes, it but was in the queue. If, Maybe it queued up. Yeah, it, it's... so many uh, emails. Yeah, my emails come through in bursts. <laughs> but um, if, you, if you let me know the link, then oh. I'll put that in. Oh, okay. It's the Shulzling. The Shulzling. It's the Shulz. What, Rabbi Wallenberg's one? Yeah. Yes, the one you're on now. The, with the same password? Yes, the yeah. one you're on now. Yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. Yes, yes. All right. Okay. Tell me something, Julian. Well, when we get the Shul letter, and it says that, can you press the link from that, from the Shul letter to get on? Uh, what Shul letter is that? The Shul newsletter that comes through. You know what they know. Lynn sends out every Friday yeah. morning? Yeah, but, um, Brenda... Can you press yes, the um, link on that? Yeah, you can, you can it works? Yes, Brenda. It does. It, it does work. It so, does so work. I, I tell you why, because Ronnie Kemp has rang up and he wants to... They, they're, they're not very good with computers. So if I tell him to press that on the... Uh, on the show Link. newsletter, he should be able to get on. Yes, he should be able to. I, I'm, I'm not I, sure of... of a, I don't think it's of, on the of, newsletter. What was the question? It is, it is. It is, Julian, um, it is. Isn't it on uh, the thing that the rabbi... What was your question? I sends out called What's On at WFUS. Oh, yeah, yes. What are you looking for? It might be that one. This is confusing, I can't. Uh, right. Jeff, Jeff was asking um, about uh, Ron Kemp clicking on to watch uh, Jeff's bar mitzvah, right. which, is, which is on your Rabbi Wallenberg uh, personal Zoom page with this, Have presumably it? with this when uh, is it? password. Sunday evening. Sunday evening, 6.30. Well, oh, I meant to rename is it. Sunday coming. Yes. 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 But, uh, anyway, is that... Um, yeah, yeah. In the what's on at WFUS that you send out, is there a something you can click on to just get yes, that there link? is. So right. if they go to wfus.org.uk/zoom, or they go to the Shaw website and they click on Stay Connect, has, does he have email? We can send him a link in email. It's probably the easiest. Yeah. Thing. Right. I'm going well, to. It's for, it's for older people that can't, that, that don't. I know. You know right. not okay. really au, au fait with all this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm it's going like, to just. You know, yeah. Papa, you know, when you send the link out, yes. when you send the link out, can't you just touch that and then it goes straight through? So you can. Sometimes, yeah. right. I'm putting in the chat now and I'll email mm. it to Jeff and Brenda as well. This is a direct link. When you click that link, you don't need a password or anything. As long as you have Zoom. If you don't have Zoom, it will install it and it should take you straight to this room. I've just put okay. it in the chat there. Okay. okay, I can email it to you as well. Um, okay, let's get our PowerPoint out. Hopefully yeah. this is- Yeah, cool. I, I want a word when we're finished, Rabbi. Yeah, sure. Won't be long. Sorry? Oh. I said, I, I okay. want to just have a little chat with you um, when we're finished this year, this morning. Okay, can I can I call you at twelve? Because I've got a chief rabbi thing at eleven. So can I phone you at twelve, Jeff? Okay, that's fine. Yeah, is that okay? Because I'm going to have to go straight on to something else at eleven. Okay, I'll phone you straight after that about twelve then. Right. Okay. Morning, Sally. Right. Let me try to get my PowerPoint. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. All be well, Sally. Mm -hmm. 
So, hope it's not going to crash. It usually does, but. Right, we're going to share this and hopefully it's going to work. Here we go. Okay, so today we're joined by a very famous Jewish gentleman. One sec. It's thinking. Okay, today we're joined by a very famous Jewish gentleman, Len <laughs> Nimoy. Um, I heard him speak at the Oxford Union, must be now, oh, 25 years ago. I think he came to speak when Shmuley Batech was in Oxford. Absolutely fascinating. He spoke about rediscovering his roots in later life. I don't know how actively Jewish he had been, but he spoke about rediscovering his roots. And he spoke about the Vulcan greeting, live long and prosper, which, of course, for those who don't know, um, was based on the duchening, what the Kohanim do with their fingers. Now, most of us don't know what the Kohanim do with their fingers because it's under their talus. But I'm reliably informed that this is what they do with both hands. They put them together like that. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. Um, Sally might know. I don't know if Phil's ever demonstrated. Um, and apparently that's where he got it from which is a beautiful idea. It's from, uh, if you Google, Google it, you'll find lots of... Yeah, lots Philip of, can lots. do it. And when Sam was born, he he did it as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, while we're talking, can I ask you a question, Sally? Did you Sam can. used to go up for dochening with Philip from an early age? No. Right. Because I, I saw an article somewhere and someone was saying, oh, I'm a Cohen and, you know, when I got for dochening, my, my kids, there's nobody to, like, you know, for them to go under their talus or whatever. And I thought, do the, do the boys at least not go up with the fathers? I don't know, maybe that's but you a have to thing. remember that, that in our experience, no one ever taught us or told us that that's what should happen. Well, I don't know it's, if it's what should happen. Or not. I'm just curious. No, no, but it doesn't appear that people have been taught how to do them. It's assumed yeah. that you know. Right. I have to watch Star Trek more, obviously. The original. <laughs> <laughs> so that is apparently, I mean, it's a beautiful idea. Live long and prosper, you know. It's kind of a paraphrasing, I suppose. Anyway, there we go. So that was the spoiler, um, uh, Mr. Spock. Uh, we've got someone on an iPad, I don't know who. Is that you, Mark? We've lost you. Who is that? Hi, Lawrence, are you with us? Lawrence, are you with us? Lawrence? Well, the room is, but not the person. All right, okay. I was talking to somebody, he said, I said, how many people do you get for your show? He said, we get 20 devices. So you can interpret that both ways. It could mean more than one person per device, or it could mean the devices are on, but the people aren't. Um, okay, so this is, last week we did NASA, we're gonna do NASA again. This week we're gonna look at the duchening. Um, okay. Iris, one second. Bye-bye, right, Mr. Spock for now. Right, Iris, have you got that on the screen? Yes. Okay. Right, would you like to read? Again, right. same as last week, funny that. <laughs> Completing the head count of the children of Israel taken in the Sinai Desert, a total of 8,580 Levite men between the ages of 30 and 50 are counted in the tally of those who will be doing the actual work of transporting the tabernacle. God communicates to Moses the law of the Sotar, the wayward wife, suspected of unfaithfulness to her husband. Also given is the law of the Nazir, who yeah. forswears wine, lets his or her hair grow long, and is forbidden to become contaminated through contact with a dead body. Right, that's what we spoke about last week. Yep. Aaron and his descendants, the Kohanim, are instructed on how to bless the people of Israel. The leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel each bring their offerings for the inauguration of the altar. Although their gifts are identical, each is brought on a different day and is individually described by the Torah. Okay, thank you very much. Very much. So today we're going to look at the um, blessing of the Kohanim, the priestly blessing. Um, let's just read the source. Who would like to read uh, number two? Any volunteers? I'll read it, if you like. Go for it. Speak to Aaron and his sons. Thus shall you bless the people of Israel. Say to them, the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord deal kindly and graciously with you. The Lord bestow his favours upon you and grant you peace. Thus they shall link my name with the people of Israel and I will bless them. Right. Okay. 
We're all familiar with that. Yes, we bless our children that Friday night. <coughs> the Kohanim on Yom Tov, when we're in Shul, do that. In Israel, they do it every day. <clears throat> right? It's far less fancy when they do it in Israel because they're used to doing it every day. Um, very interesting website, which Ben Gonshaw has produced. Did anyone see that? It was on yeah. SXK with the different Duchening tunes. No. Right, I'll share it later. Worth a look. They've got the Boundary Road one, Mark. And they've got a few others as well. Very interesting, okay. trying to make different tunes for Dukhaning. <clears throat> the main reason it seems for the tunes is so that people have time to say the various extra verses or prayers and things like that. Okay, so there's the source. Speak to Aaron and his sons and say to them, this is how you will bless the children of Israel. You will say to them as follows. Right, the Lord bless you and protect you. Uh, the Lord deal kindly and graciously with you. May the Lord bestow his favor upon you and grant you peace. And this is thus you should say to the, uh, sorry, you shall place my name, you shall link my name to the people of Israel and I will bless them. Interestingly, some people, when they do this at weddings, for example, they'll say this whole lot. They'll include the last line as well as part of the whole formula of the blessing. Speak to Aaron and his sons and at the end. Okay. So it's a mitzvah that the priests have, the Kohanim, and they make a bracha beforehand. Anyone ever noticed what the bracha is? Let's have a look. It's from the Talmud. I'll just give you the Hebrew and someone can read the English. So the Gemara says, What is the blessing made on the Duchening? Duchen, by the way, is I think it's originally probably Hebrew Aramaic and it means a platform because they always go up to some kind of a stage. Duchan. So Duchening is a corruption like Shabosas or, uh, or uh, Talesim. Talitot. But anyway, so Reb Zera said in the name of Rachista, Asher Kishon Mikdusha Social Aharon. It's unusual, right? It's not Asher Kishon Mitzvah Sov. It's Asher Kishon. He has sanctified us. Mikdusha Social Aharon. But Zivanu Lavarech Hazam Yisrael Biyahava. Who would like to read that in English? Anyone? Iris? No, you read already. Pam, Julian, Sally. Sally, you were courage. The Gemara yeah. asks, what blessing do the priest recite before the benediction? Rabbi Zaira says that Rav has Hista <laughs> said, Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with the sanctity of Aaron and commanded us to bless his people Israel with love. Okay. So a few things, by the way. Why is this given to the priests? It's not given to the prophets or the kings or the rabbis. It's given specifically to the Kohanim. And why in this unique form, it says, Levarich Hesamo Yisrael, to bless the people of Israel with love in love true love okay um there is a famous question whether a mitzvah requires kavana right so for example um i always give the classic example i don't know let's say i decide to go stand outside labushri on sukkahs with my lord of an estrog and bother the people coming and going not bother them obviously say would you like to a quick mitzvah and someone very grumpy comes along and sort of you know um I say, would you like to bench all of? No, thank you. I don't do organized religion. Well, go on. It'll only take 30 seconds. No, no, no. Oh, all right. Just to get you out of my hair. And they sort of, you know, say the bracha through, you know, gritted teeth and, and shake the lulav, nearly, nearly break it. Um, and later on that day, I get a phone call from that person. Let's say someone I know. Let's I know. We'll call them uh, whatever. Uh, um, um. Well, based on the book of Ruth, there is a character in the book of Ruth called Poloni, Almoni. Um, and we're told that's not actually his name. It's basically the nice way of saying anonymous. So we find actually, if you look in, for example, in the Gabai book, when it wants to say someone's name from Misha Berk, it says Pei Ben Pei, and Pei is short for Ploni. So Ploni is not a real name. It's the equivalent of Anon, A, 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 N, um, what is it? A dot N O N or whatever. So, um, so we'll call him Ploni. So Ploni phones me up in the afternoon and says, Rabbi, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be so disrespectful this morning. You know, I was just having a bad morning. I just lost my job and things are very wrong for me. And, you know, I'd like to come around and shake the little love again. I'll do it with more respect this time. And of course, when he comes to do it, he's not going to say the bracha. Why? Because he's already done the mitzvah. Even though he did it in a very <laughs> shambolic way, you did the mitzvah, right? If you give someone money for tzedakah, whether you do it through gritted teeth, whether you do it reluctantly, whether you do it with love, the fact is you did the mitzvah. So do mitzvahs require kavanah? We had this with the Omer just now, right? You're not supposed to say, it. Oh, oh, hey guys, tonight's the 10th night of the Omer if you haven't yet counted. 
So it's a whole debate whether mitzvahs require kavana or not. Generally speaking, we say that whilst kavana, which means the right concentration and the right meditations and the right intent, is always preferable, it's not necessarily compulsory. This mitzvah, though, it says you have to have love. There's a component of the mitzvah is to bless the people with love. Why does it require love? Right? And in fact, obvious question, I'm surprised that someone hasn't asked it yet. What do we need these kohanim for anyway? Why can't God bless us directly? What do we need human beings to be our intermediaries for? Um, and what does it say? He says, let them link my name to the Israelites and I will bless them. So what do we need them for? It comes from God anyway. So we need um, to see something actually happening. Right. Very interesting. OK, I don't know if anyone gives that. That's actually really I, I really like that, actually, the optics of it. So tangible. get a blessing from it needs to be tangible. I like that, actually. Yeah, so visual tangible. visual aids, visual aids. I'm not sure anyone says that. Actually. It's a really interesting point. Um, I want to just focus on the word love for a minute because it's interesting. Um, I hope it, it's it's not a secret, but I'm not going to name a name. Um, but uh, I was involved in a situation where somebody unfortunately was sent to prison for a couple of years and he happened to be a Cohen. And the nature of Jewish communities being what they are, most people, I think, if you get sent to prison, even it wasn't an open prison, actually, it was quite an unpleasant prison, but it was for fraud. If you get sent to prison, um, I think duchening is the last thing on your mind. But for the, uh, for the uh, people left behind, including some of this gentleman's close friends, the moment he got sentenced, the first thing on their minds was, well, we're not going to let him dochen anymore. I said, well, he's going to be in prison for two years. So I don't think we're going to, oh, well, well, he can't dochen. Anyway, a whole debate. Um, when he gets out, can he dochen or not? So we didn't deal with it straight away. But as he came near the release, it became a question as to whether he could dochen or not. Um, and he was absolutely adamant that as a Cohen, he had the birthright to go up to dochen. It's an interesting discussion. One of the reasons that if a Cohen doesn't want a dochen, um, we politely ask them to excuse themselves is because it's not becoming either for the Cohen or for the rest of us to deny the Cohen his right to go up to the front and Duchen. So if he doesn't want to do that for some reason, better that he should slip out of the room than be in the room. And it, it, it's it's disrespectful to his station almost. Right? Be like, you know, if the chief rabbi came and he said, I don't want to sit at the front. So they might say, no, Chief Rabbi, if you're not going to sit at the front, it's people are going to say we, we disrespected you. It's almost better that you should just watch it on Zoom or whatever. You know, if you're going to come and sit in the back, people are going to say we got the Chief Rabbi to sit in the back, right? even though we didn't. Um, Barasayan so, again. Yes, absolutely. Right. You have things like that. Um, I'm always very conscious of this when Mayor Salaznik is here. Right. Um, you know, he has a long standing connection to the community. He's a, a very eminent retired rabbi. The first time he was here for Shabbos, when I think his mother was ill or when Rafi was ill, I said, look, you're going to come sit at the front. He said, I really don't want to. I'll be a backbencher. Um, so I think in my sermon, I made a point of mentioning that um, something to that effect that people should realize that we, we, we had offered so that it doesn't look disrespectful. Mm -hmm. But from the other side, I know for myself, sometimes you're quite happy not to be made a fuss of. Anyway, so this chap was a bit of an awkward so and so. So he was absolutely adamant that he's a Cohen, he has the absolute right to duchen. The general feeling seems to be that you can't tell a Cohen he can't duchen. Um, you could say to him, Liz, I don't think it's a very good idea. But there is one interesting angle, which I discussed with the Dianim, and the angle was this angle of love, right? It doesn't generally say that the person that uh, reads from the Torah or the person that, I don't know, opens the ark or the person that does Hagba or the person that reads the synopsis or the announcements or even... Uh, I don't know, does the wedding service has to be something you actually like, right? It just says they have to do the job, they have to lead. Interestingly, there's a few places where popularity becomes an issue. One is the chazan for the yomim Naraim. Every year we learn the halachas beforehand, and one of the halachas is that somebody who will not be pleasing to the congregation shouldn't go up and serve as a chazan. Somebody who's going to foster ill feeling, they may have a beautiful voice, they may be an opera singer, they may, might do the most sweet and, and meaningful and deep davening imaginable. But if, for example, there's somebody in the crowd that there's a broigus with that's going to cause ill feeling or somebody's going to leave because of it, somebody's going to walk out or there are people who are going to have ill will in their hearts towards this person, then it's not desirable. So we find the same thing here. It says, and we'll see why, that they have to bless the people of Israel, but ahava with love. So the question is, whose love is it? Is it the love of the Kohanim for the people? Is it God's love for the people? 
or is it right because it says uh, with love whose love is it or is it the people's love for the Kohen so the, there is a halachic view that because the Kohen has to bless the people with love if the love ain't there they're not feeling the love as they say then the Kohen shouldn't go up so if by the Kohen going up you know someone's going to walk out that's not love right that's hatred so there is an angle to this mitzvah. So um, if somebody <laughs> marries out, they're not, and they're a Kohen, they're not allowed to duchen. But they might be very, because they've fallen in love, if you like, with the wrong person, Ooh, why yeah. are they denied sharing? Different kind of love. Because a Kohen has to uh, stay within the tribe. Look, anyone who marries out, strictly speaking, has sanctions. We've relaxed them over the years. We've become more tolerant. But the Kohen, it's an absolute. If the Kohen does that, he abandons his station. So uh, that's the simple reality. He, you know, he made that makes decision? a choice. <clears throat> Who made that decision? The Torah said. The Torah speaks quite clearly about the Kohen that uh, Kohen says the Kohen has to marry yeah. Mizera Israel from somebody who's from from the tribe. The truth is, we all have to. Yeah, Pam. Rabbi, um, the sound went funny. Who, who? What's the halachic blue? view whose love is it that counts no we don't have an answer to that but oh. on the basis that the love might be referring to the cohen's relationship with the people he's blessing then if they're not feeling the love right sally's asking about a different type of love and out marriage the simple reality is and this is where the most tolerant of rabbis can't really bend um, is it's quite clear that a cohen that does certain things loses his status i mean ask about marrying divorcees never mind marrying out i mean that's far more painful for certain Kohanim, obviously. Um, and uh, without passing without passing the buck, um, I guess that's, oh, one second, I'm just hearing a child. I'll just check there's an adult with him. Is somebody with him? Yeah, okay, right. I guess somebody's with him. Okay, just checking, you know, right, okay. Um, so, so, so what the Dayanim said was that maybe this Kohen should go to a shore where nobody knows him and he can dochen, but for him to come to his own shore where people are unhappy and it's going to cause bad feeling, um, it's very hard. You can't turn around. Look, it's like, um, I don't know, let's say you had a situation. We've had similar situations, unfortunately, happened in Boreham Wood with a certain person that ended up in prison, a different story. Um, you know, somebody walks into shore and says, um, I don't know it's my son's bar mitzvah today and i have an absolute right to an aliyah and the gabbai says you do have a right to an aliyah you're right because it's your son's bar mitzvah um but uh because you were uh, i don't know you're convicted molester or fraudster people don't want you getting called up in our shore person says well here in the shulchan Aruch, it says i have the right to be called up and the gabbai says can you be a mensch please and can you just leave and the person says i'm not leaving it's my right yeah you know it's like you know these protesters in america saw a great quote i'm not talking about the black lives that's a terrible issue in itself but before that there was a great quote which is such a trump kind of thing to say although he didn't say it some guy somewhere says i i refuse to go into lockdown because i ain't doing covid 19 innocent until proven guilty right so this guy's worrying about his constitutional rights meanwhile we're trying to save your life from getting infected with a deadly disease. It's not about guilt or innocence. People have a certain misunderstanding of things. I had a story many years ago um, of, and I still don't know what happened exactly, but it, there were two sisters and evidently there'd been a falling out oh, with the two brothers-in-law and it did affect sister's relationship. It sounds like they kept it under wraps, but it was always just beneath the surface. So one of the two husbands died relatively young, I think early 60s, quite He had cancer for a few months and he died. And the widow, who was quite distraught already, got in touch with me and said, I'm telling you now, if my brother-in-law comes, there will be a scene. If he comes to Levi, there will be a scene. I do not want him there. He didn't get on with my husband. He had nothing good to say about him in his, in his life. I don't <coughs> want him there. I think the phrase used was dancing on his grave. <clears throat> okay, look, the widow doesn't want the brother-in-law there. So what do you do? You phone up the brother-in-law say, please don't come. What's the problem? This guy had a yard of his father that day. And he wanted to go to the grave of his father's grave. And he decides that... So, so I, I phoned him. And I said, look, I've got a situation here. I, said, I don't know who's right and who's wrong. But I do know I don't want a scene that will be to everyone's detriment. He says, well, it's my father's yacht. I have the right to visit my father's grave. I said, okay. I said, could you possibly go at a different time? Do you have to go at the same time 
as this Leviah. I said, I don't want to see you embarrassed or anyone else embarrassed. Well, it's my right. No, anyway, in the end, to his credit, he didn't come. Um, the interesting thing is apparently he never he not visited his father's grave on the yacht site in about 20 years. So he suddenly got it into his head. He's going to do it now. You know, you're dealing with this kind of thing. It, it's very hard to ban people from things. Uh, you can have a quiet word and say, please, can you just be civilized about this? But it's very hard to ban people from things. So I'm not sure you can ban a Cohen from going up to Dochening if he is a legitimate Cohen, right? Now, if he's married out, that's a different story. But in general, you can't tell a Cohen just because he's a fraudster, they can't go up to Dochen. But you can say to him, you know, if you're a mensch, you wouldn't do it. How do you, you know say that Cohen is a Cohen? Oh, that's another question. Interesting question. How can say the brocha? So there are people around who can trace themselves back to Aaron, but most Kohanim, we don't really. It's just an assumption. And hypothetically, if a person comes to a town and says, we get this from time to time, someone comes to get married or there's a tombstone and we sudden people come to get married and somewhere it says they're a levy and like, oh, are you a levy? Oh, I didn't know. Well, one second. So you didn't know. Uh, so are you, aren't you? Where's the record of it? You know, and things computer. like that. It's, on the it's not always on. The, in your case, it might be that but you'd be surprised how many times it gets missed out. Because we didn't know that Phil was a Cohen until we looked to my father looked at the Ketuba. That's interesting, because most people would have said the name would be a giveaway. Not always, but Kaplan's a very Cohen name, right? It means priest uh, in Polish. Oh, no? yeah. Um, just on the subject of names, Kaplan seems to come from Cohen. Um, Katz also is a abbreviation. I think I mentioned this recently. Cohen Sedek, righteous Cohen, Katz. So Katz is a usually Cohen's. Um, I don't know where Kahan right, comes from. With a C or a K, because in Israel they insist on spelling. I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. Kaplan. I don't know how it's connected to Cohen, actually, but it is. Um, Kovacs in Hungarian. A lot of people call Kovacs, I believe, came from Cohen. Khan, Khan, etc. Um, a lot of Levium are called Seagal. If someone's called Seagal, they're often a Levy. This comes from an abbreviation of Sagan la Kohen, which means an assistant to the Kohen. A Sagan, like in, in, in Israel, the Sagan is the assistant commander in the army, in the unit. Um, Getz, Geretzedek, righteous convert. I don't understand Getz was a Ger, but Getz. Um, all kinds of names that seem to have uh, interesting origins. Anyway, so I look, we don't know people's Yechas for sure. Um, it, you know, it could all change. Um, a person walks into shore, are you kind of a Levy? No. Right. Sometimes you have to clarify. It's a bit like you say, someone walks in the shore, you say, would you like to do psicha? Oh, no, 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 thank you. Would you like to go up and open the ark? You don't have to say anything. All you have to do is pull the string. Oh, thank you very much. So it kind of depends how you word it. So I can imagine a scenario where you say, someone, you're Kona Levy. And you know, a non-Jew walks in shore, you're Kona Levy. He says, I don't think so. Okay, thanks very much. Meanwhile, you say, do you know what Kona Levy is? No, I've got no idea. So you probably have to qualify the question. Um, so we, I don't know if everyone's yichas is absolute. But we generally, most Kohanim especially, are quite proud of their family roots. And as you may know, there have been various, uh, you know, DNA, uh, I don't know, test experiments that have shown that there is DNA that's prevalent in Ashkenazi Kohanim that is not prevalent in others. So there you go. Anyway, so this business of love, I have found that DNA in the tribe, the African tribe that claims um, to be descended from uh, Jewish tribes. Yeah, could be. Yeah. They, fa um, they found the Kohenim um, in, in their in their priests. It could be. Uh, anyway, let's. Uh, I've met all kinds of people called Cohen. <laughs> no, nope. it's not urgent. All right, thanks. Met all kinds of people called Cohen that are not Jewish. Um, Leonard Cohen, of course, was Jewish. So they think became a Buddhist at some point. Um, anyway, uh, there's all kinds of stories. Um, there was. A, I know somebody who is married to a non-Jew and he's called Tony Cohen and it took me a while to figure that one out but he liked the name so he took his wife's name it was really confusing really mm. confusing okay so we've got this concept of love so much so that it might be a halachic basis to say to a Cohen that if if you're not feeling the love for the people or vice versa maybe you shouldn't do it. so love is important here right mitzvahs need kavana they don't need kavana clearly to bless somebody you have to have some kind of understanding of what's going on okay now so what is this What's with this love? And why the Kohanim? Why not just have God bless us directly? I think I told you, Rabbi Yossi Jacobson, who's become quite a famous speaker, I've known him for quite a few years, um, was once sitting on a plane and he was sitting next to, a, I think, a, a Protestant. And the, they were talking and the Protestant says, you know, these Catholics are so stupid. You know, they need the Pope as an intermediary to God. He says, we go straight to Yoshka. So Rabbi Jacobson said, I, I didn't tell him my thoughts on that. Right? <laughs> 
Um, so, okay, what, what are the explanations for this? Let's see. Why do we need Kohanim to bless us at all? Oh, there's Leonard again. Right, Spock. Did Spock have a first name? <laughs> did he come? I don't think he did. Right. So, um, oh. I don't know if his hairstyle is because he's a Vulcan or because it's the 70s. Okay, or 60s even, wasn't it? The 60s. Okay. Um, so let's go back to this crucial line. They shall place my name, link my name with the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So through the Kohanim, God blesses us. Let's see some explanations. Oh, there's some more Jewish looking ones, not more Jewish, more traditional. That's the Kotel in better times, right? There's everyone. Uh, twice a year, Cholomot, Sukkot, Cholomot, Pesach have an amazing thing. We're worth it once in a lifetime. I think I went once, where all the Kohanim come and at a certain time they have Duchening, tens of thousands of Kohanim, the most beautiful sight. You often see pictures with all the Talesin. We went last year. Yeah. Because oh. Dana's dad is a Cohen and we went right. with him. Right. It's it an amazing experience. It's a very amazing, amazing experience. Um, so who would like to read? Mark, would you like to read as a Cohen yourself? Yes. The priests were the sacred group within the people. They ministered in the house of God. Really? They spent their lives in divine service. Their life's work was sacred. So was their habitat. They were the guardians of holiness. They were therefore the obvious choice for the sacred right of bringing down God's blessings upon the people. Right, you want someone to give a blessing from God? Who do you look to? The most spiritual people, right? You know, people ask, you know, sometimes it, it's interesting. When I was in Yeshiva, um, so the guy that used to do the, oh, he might be watching on Facebook actually. Probably. Anyway, never mind. I won't say it. But, like, you know, sometimes it, it in some shuls, the Gabbai does the Misha Beras, in some shuls, the Chazan does it, some shuls, the Rabbi does it. Some people feel they like, they feel that maybe the Rav is, I don't know, more holy or something. They want him to make the blessings, you know, different things. You know, um, in, in more form circles, it's a big honor to ask, like, you know, big names to come and do the blessings at weddings. And he's, oh, wow, you know, Diane so and so came and did a Sheva Brach or whatever. But look, these are the people that the Kohanim spent their lives in holiness, right? They didn't, if you remember, they didn't even have land in the land of Israel, come to that in a minute, because they were in the temple the whole time. So if you want a blessing, go to someone who's a holy person that's tuned into that, right? That's their role. Their role is to channel God's blessing and holiness through their divine service. So that makes sense. That's the Sefer HaChinuch, which is one commentary. Here's another one, the Matnas Aaron. Um, uh, Sally, would you like to read? Priests had no share in the land. Their sole income was from the Matanot Kahuna, the gifts of the priests that was their due from the people as a whole. It followed that they had an interest in the people prospering because then they too would prosper. They would bless the people with a full heart seeking their good because they would benefit thereby. Interesting, ulterior yeah. motive. Like that. Mm. So I don't know if anyone knows this, but Mark, you might need to know this one day when Mashiach comes and you live off all of our fruit and vegetables. <laughs> um, there wasn't a rotor system you could choose which Cohen you gave your tithes to, right? Which opens up, I suppose, for some favoritism and bartering. So the Matna Saran says that they wanted to bless the people they should prosper because the people prospering means the people will bring them more fruit and veg, basically. So uh, self-serving reason. Wouldn't they do it because that's what they wanted to do, not because of the reward? Okay, you know, that's like, it's like anything, isn't it? You know, we say, you know, um, <laughs> do people do things for ulterior reasons? And even if you have an ulterior motive, but it's a somewhat, you know, noble one. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. We're just learning in the morning, the halachas of, of testimony. So a person who is considered biased is not supposed to be a witness. So at a wedding, we always say, you know, you can't have relatives and so on. So I once had a wedding. Um, the only person there that was basically uh, observant and not related to anyone was the photographer. So I asked him if he'd be a witness. He was very nice about it. Um, Mr. Kalati, some of you probably know from Edgeware, Adrian Kalati. Um, very nice man. So he was very nice mm -hmm. about it. And it probably affected some of his pictures, but he became the witness for me. And I happened to be chatting to Diane Gelly about something else afterwards. I don't remember how it came up, but Diane Gelly said, we discussed whether you're actually allowed to use a paid officiant or paid um, agent, I can't think of the word, contractor at a wedding, because the witness has to be somebody who, if something's wrong, say the ring is not the right value, or they see a problem with things, they're prepared to say, this is not good. Now, somebody who's getting paid to be the photographer at the wedding, um, that's not really gonna work very well, is it? Um, 
you know, there was a case a few years ago with one, one of those tragedies in Israel with a wedding hall or something. Um, I think it was in Israel or in America. There was a wedding hall. There was a terrible tragedy. I'm not even sure if it was a Jewish wedding. Anyway, the story was that the photographer who was being paid to cover the event took pictures of the, I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was that, that I think, oh no, I'm sorry. I'll tell you what it was. There was a wedding and there was a terrible traffic accident outside. So the wedding photographer took some pictures of the accident and um, ultimately sold them to the press and made a lot of money. It's not very nice, I know. Maybe it was some famous celebrity. I don't remember the details. Um, the, I don't know if it was a Jewish family, but whoever was making the simcha sued the photographer because he said, we contracted you to cover our simcha and we agreed that any pictures you took would, we paid you a lot of money for the rights to those pictures. And that includes the pictures you took on the street during our simcha. And the photographer said, no, it was completely different. <laughs> I wasn't part of the contract. I don't know who won the case. It was an interesting case, very sad case. Um, but anyway, the photographer doesn't want the wedding to be abandoned because then he's not going to get paid. Probably everyone's going to, you know, especially if he gets paid on the night. So the question is, can the photographer be a witness? Can the rabbi be a witness? I don't know if all rabbis get paid. They generally don't get paid for convents weddings. People sometimes give me a gift. Um, but let's say you're getting paid. Um, so interesting, it seems in halacha that the one person they don't worry about is the is, that even if the rabbi is getting paid for the wedding, the assumption is that he will rise above that and he will do the right thing and he can be a witness. It's interesting. Um, so even though Yes, he might be getting paid. Nonetheless, we assume that he's also doing it for the right reason. So I guess with the Kalanim also, you know, of course they're going to benefit from the people's bounty. But at the end of the day, they want the people to prosper. So even if it's a slight ulterior motive, it might not be the end of the world. That's a bit cynical. The Manus Aaron is, Aaron is a bit cynical. Um, here's another interesting idea. Um, this is from Vayikra. Um, it's after the consecration of the there's some kohanim like we might see there we go a couple of guys there with their hands under the talus i don't know when the picture was taken probably hopefully during the week um after the consecration of the tabernacle it says aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them and then he stepped down after offering the offerings um so the commentaries say this this isn't mandated by god this was a spontaneous the blessing late comes later on for the kohanim this was a spontaneous blessing out of his love for the people and his generosity of spirit and his reward say some of the commentaries is that he was given the the the, the merit of blessing the people because of his spontaneity so it all comes back to aaron and this incident which you, i never even noticed that it says after the consecration of the tabernacle he blessed lifted up his hands i guess like, like that and blessed the people let's see what the commentaries say on that so rashi says the blessing he gave the people on that occasion was indeed the priestly blessing like we have in our parsha here. So Aaron gave him the priestly blessing the first time it occurs. Whether God put the words in his mouth, he made it up, I don't know. The Ramban, Nachmandi, says perhaps the blessing was spontaneous, but because he showed such generosity of spirit, he was given the reward that his descendants would bless his own future. We know, by the way, that Aaron loved peace, right? And he loved the created beings, right? So it makes sense that he would want to bless them with generosity of spirit. Interesting idea. So, whose love is it? Whose love is it? Is it the priest's love for us? Or is it God's love for us? The Brocha says he commanded us to bless his people with love. Or you could read it as he commanded in love bless the people. for the priest to bless the people, right? I threw my mother out of the window a towel. Yes? So... <laughs> eats shoots and leaves it's the usual grammatical problem right and in hebrew like in yiddish you can add something at the end that qualifies the whole thing right so you know this business uh, is probably out of fashion now when the kids would say i really enjoy school not so in yiddish that's what you say right uh blah 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 nisht and you put the nisht at the end and it changes the sentence right? like you say right no changes the whole um positive to negative so there seems to be an idea that the whole duchening business is rooted uh, not in some technical process. Yeah, the Kohanim are a channel for God's blessings. There's a very beautiful idea that the original blessing came from Aaron, who did it spontaneously out of love, and it continues out of love. So now, relevant to our case above about someone who's duchening, who people don't like, this is from the Zohar, which, of course, is Kabbalistic. It says, I put the large letters, not the Zohar, a priest who does not love the people or who is not loved by the people 
may not bless. Now, like I said, this isn't halakha, right? I don't think you can bar a priest from entry. Well, COVID-19 might render that, unfortunately. But in general, you can't tell a Kohen he can't go up to Dochen. You can definitely tell him that based on this, he's got no business going up to Dochen if there is going to be this particular problem. Now, interestingly, I knew a very nice man who I won't name many years ago, not here in this community, really nice man, very, very traditional, very traditional, um, not sort of um, very from, but very traditional. And he told me that he doesn't like to go up for Duchening because back in the old days, he used to look around Shaw and used to think, um, I don't like these. So, that he, sorry, right. A lot of people say, oh, I don't feel worthy. So he didn't say that. He said that he used to look around in Shaw years ago and he would see some of the crooks that only came from Rosh Hashanah Kippur that would get up to Duchen. He thought, you know, I don't need these guys blessing me. They happen to be Kohanim. So, you know. So I said to him, uh, but, but you're not a crook. We would love you to bless us. Anyway, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. But um, on the one hand, we say, yeah, but the point is they're Kohanim and that's their birthright. On the other hand, there is this idea. The Kohen has to mean it. There has to be that love. You have to feel the love. Um, grammatically, the Brocha says, Yisrael, to bless the children of Israel, but Ahava with love, would seem to imply it's the Kohanim that have to have the love. Let's have a look at another example of love, where it's ambiguous as well. Right? Well, not so much ambiguous, but it's challenging the love. Right? When, when Isaac summons Esau before his death, right? He said, it seems very, very shallow. What does he say to him? Make me some food that I love and bring it to me so I can give you my innermost blessing before I die. Right? It seems to be implying, right, that the way to man's heart is through his stomach. Yes, we usually assume that applies to, I don't know, husbands and wives. But um, here, Asa, Yitzchak says, you know, I want to give you the best brochas I can, the deepest brochas. Um, in order to do that, I need food that I like. You have to arouse my love. It's a strange one, right? That by you bringing out my love, through preparing food for me. Now, we're going to assume that he's not so shallow. It's not the food he loves. It's he loves the fact that Asaph is a hunter and he goes and he gets food for his dad, right? It's the, the way it's prepared lovingly by his son. I know Asaph gets a bad press, but here, that's, again, whose love is it? So it, the, what does he love? Does he love the food or does he love the act of preparing the food, right? It's a little bit ambiguous. It's the usual, it's the same as we said here. Um, Whichever it is, he says that in order to give the bracha, I need to feel the love. It's interesting. I have this idea. You need to feel love to give a bracha. Right? Probably, I guess, the most heartfelt brachas are often the brachas the parents give their children. Right? I don't know if you saw the story. I've told it before. Um, I can't tell it without getting very emotional about the Kloisenberger Rebbe that after the war, the girl that comes to him and says, you know, my parents used to bless me, Erev Yom Kippur, but I have no parents. They died in the camps. And he says, well... He says, I'm in the same boat. He says, I lost my kids. I don't know if he said exactly, but he lost his kids in the war. He said, I lost my kids. He says, I'll bless you. And then he gets a whole line of orphans that come for a brocha. Um, so that's a heartfelt blessing, right? You know, it's something you really feel. Um, So why is love relevant? I'll ask you another question. If the Kohen is just the channel for God's brocha, right, he's just the kind of megaphone, right, what does it even matter what he's like? What does it even matter what his attitude is? So that can go both ways. Thank you, dear. Very kind. Uh, that can go, but oops, that can go both ways, right? Yeah. So you could say that uh, since the Kohen is only the channel for it, it doesn't matter. The other way you could look at it is you could say that since the Kohen is the channel for God's blessing, he has to be particularly pure and particularly given over to the task. And if he doesn't feel the love and the compassion, it's not going to work. <laughs> so Kohen has to be selfless when he gives the bracha. And love is selflessness. Anyone remember how you say love in Hebrew? We just said it. Ahava. Anyone know the root of Ahava? I think I mentioned it recently. Anyone remember this? Okay, it's ha. In Aramaic, it's the word have. Ahava means to give. So the etymology of the word love in Hebrew is not romantic, you know, fireworks and thunder and lightning and special effects and, you know, the earth moving and what have you. It's giving, right? 
fiddle on the roof. Do you love me? Do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed, what is it, ironed your shirts, whatever. Yeah. So love is about giving, right? That's a little bit, you know, doesn't sound very romantic, but love is about giving. So the Kohanim, loving the people means being given over, being selfless, right? Um, that's what people do for love. Yaakov worked seven years for his love, right? It's, it's romantic in modern terms. It's about giving. It's about selflessness. Um, so that's one way of understanding it. Um, I think that's the last off. Let me just check that. Yes. Um, so the Cohen's blessing to us has to be done with love. There's a few ways to understand that. Number one is simply that there has to be that feeling of love. So if you don't like your Cohen or he doesn't like you, you've got a problem. Right? The other way of understanding it is love in the sense of giving, of being given over, being selfless, of being this channel for God's blessings. Right? I also like the idea, you know, we so much that we do is based on something that someone did a long time ago, right? We just celebrated Shavuot because Moshe got the tablets on the mountain, right? We do certain things because of the golden calf, right? We do certain things because of Adam and Eve, believe it or not, right? We don't have original sin in Judaism, but we definitely have certain things. I mean, our whole approach to human uh, modesty and intimacy and shame and embarrassment is tied in with eating from the tree, right? If we hadn't eaten from the tree, I don't know exactly how that would work with being naked but we would have a very different kind of relationship with all these things um the fact that aaron according to those commentaries spontaneously blessed the people whether it was with god's words or however it was um lifted his hands to bless the people said it's a beautiful thing capture that moment freeze it in time and now aaron's descendants will do that for all of eternity now you run into a little problem of course that you say it's a bit like you know the landed gentry that sometimes the uh the heirs are not necessarily worthy so okay so maybe it comes back to the original question. I don't know if two or three year old boys should go up to, or girls, I know, an interesting question, but two or three year old boys should go up to Duchen with their father. I don't know the answer to that. I imagine that if children are too small, they might distract. But by the same token, I also imagine that if you're a Cohen and you're tuned into this, it's something you're going to want to teach your kids from a very young age. So that as they grow up, it's something that is very special to them and is very loving to them. Right? And the love point is very important. The Cohen should be giving those brochures and should enjoy blessing the people. Uh, they should consider it a great privilege to be a channel of God's blessings. And yes, we probably should. We did it a few years ago, Sally. We did Cohen training. We should probably do it again. Let's get back into Shaw first. We should probably do Cohen training, definitely. Um, so live long and prosper. I don't know if these words say live long and prosper, but certainly it's a nice idea that uh, Derek, um, Derek, not Derek Nimmo, Lennon Nimoy took from his it roots. Is Derek. Leonard. No, no, he's a different one. Leonard, Leonard. Nimoy talk from, um, from his roots. It's a very beautiful idea of blessing. Blessing is giving and conveying. So that's what we see. Um, just looking at something here quickly. Uh -huh. um, okay. So um, a, a point we've touched on is that the Kohanim what did they do? They served the people, right? They served in the temple. When you went with your various offerings, the Kohen basically did it for you. They had no property of their own. They were reliant on the people for all their food and their gifts. And basically they were servants, right? They were servants. They were in service. So the other point is, you know, if you want an example of, you know, people talk about with royalty, they talk about, you know, the idea of service, right? You know, joking aside and, and controversies aside, you know, you have this kind of, it's interesting, we start talking the tangent about Malchut, and you have a pyramid and it's either at the top or the bottom, basically. So on the one hand, royalty are, when you're royal and you're elevated, you're at the top of the hierarchy. On the other hand, you serve. The Kohen serves us, and yet he's in this position of authority. A Rav serves a community. We use the term serve, which implies servitude, and yet we say you're also an authority figure, right? service industry it's interesting so if you want an example of love and devotion you look no further than the cohen who serves the people so i think that touches on what sally said which is i think is very very um it's not mentioned explicitly in the commentaries but i think it's also a very good point is um it's very nice saying god blesses you i i want the optics of having someone standing in front of me wrapped in a talus it's all mystical it's you know it's quite of quite you know um 
I mean, I don't know how people react to Dukhanin because I'm usually under my talus. I know my wife finds it extremely emotive. She really misses it when we don't have a Kohen or when we don't have Dukhanin. You know, she's really, we, really... We were always feels... told that you must turn around, that you must not look towards the... Ah, let's talk about that. Let's conclude with that. That's a good thing to just end on. Um, if any other questions, we can talk about them. But so this is the... Is, so... I thought it, I thought it was disrespectful to right, turn your back that. on the Cohen. Yeah, but um, let's talk you about should that. look down and not right, look. Let's at talk them. about that. Correct. I don't know why we don't look at the Kohanim. I think it's to do with the, the you know the great light that's shining and whatever. It's the revelation and so on. It's there. They're connected to God, and we don't want to see it directly. I, I'm not even sure the reasons for that. I should look it up. But you're not supposed to look directly at the Kohanim, right? Could we also uh, humility when someone's giving you a bracha that you sort of you, you look down. Um, which gave rise to, right? What's the word for a custom in Hebrew? Hook. Yeah, or another one? Minhag, yeah? Minhag, yeah. yeah. And Nahag in Hebrew is a driver. So Nahag means to, to drive or to behave, right? <laughs> Hanhagah means behavior. So Minhag is how you behave, a custom, something you do. Um, so there's a famous thing. It says the word Minhag, Mem, Nun, Hey, Gimel, has the same letters as the word Gehinon, which means hell in Judaism, right? Um, not the Christian hell where you're eternal damnation, but the Jewish one where um, perhaps for up to 11 months you have to suffer a little bit. Anyway, um, so why? The answer is because sometimes you have a custom which ends up basically um, destroying something which is more important. So people say, oh, because, you know, uh, listen, people in families will fall out over a minhag. Yeah, you know, people probably get divorced over minhag, right? It's silly. Rice on Pesach is a minhag. Don't get into a family fight about it. Yeah, um, you know the famous story with the covering of the challah. Everyone knows the story of the Chafetz Chaim, right? The Chafetz Chaim, who wrote the book about Lush and horror, very big on how you speak to people. So famously, um, why do we cover the challah Friday night? Because we're not making the brach on it first. We're making kiddush to so out of respect to the challah, to so not embarrass the challah. We cover it. So the story goes: the Chafetz Chaim is in a certain town, and there's a very wealthy gentleman that had the honor of hosting the holy rabbi for the friday night dinner and they're in shul and as they're walking home he's saying you know it's so good you're coming to us you know we're the most strictly kosher family in town and we're so careful and we're so from and we're so this and, you know we're so holy and it's going on the whole time about how from they are and how kosher and you know um it's so good you're coming to us because you can't trust anyone else anyway they get home the table set beautifully you know candles burning silver gold everything you know set for a king um the one thing is there's no cover on the challah. And the guy starts yelling at his wife, you know, you stupid woman, what are you doing? And we've got this great rabbi and he's going to think we're such ignoramuses. He's not even going to trust our kashrut now. And you know, what's going on over here? And, oh, you silly woman. I can't trust you with anything. And the Chavetz Chaim says to him, why do we cover the challah? He thinks, oh no, now, now he's testing. me." He says, so we don't embarrass it. He says, aha, uh -huh. and your wife? <laughs> right? It's a famous story. I believe it happened. Uh, so, you know, it's priorities. So a minhag is great. But be careful, because sometimes a minhag... So here we have a classic example. People have this beautiful minhag that you turn around during Dukhani. No, you shouldn't turn around. You shouldn't have your back to someone that's blessing you. You're not supposed to look at the Kohen. So you put the talus over your head, or you look down, or you hold your machsa up. But you don't turn around. But it comes out of a, a, a mistaken idea. But it's a classic... That's a classic example of an of a, of a unfortunate custom that is fundamentally flawed. I'm sure there are others as well. But that's the one that springs to mind. Um, that's a good bit to put in a booklet for Rosh Hashanah. Yes appropriate behaviors uh if people are going to be in shore even well even so that's a i have mentioned it from time to time i once there was a time when people were being a bit noisy for dochening so i got up and i said this is an auspicious time of blessings you know when we are getting these blessings and we should really stop and think about what's happening so a guy was actually a cohen <laughs> came up to you afterwards and said what's the source for that i said i don't know <laughs> it's got to be true though it sounds good <laughs> yeah. blessings you know um so um respect respect uh, and you often get, they talk about the, Le the Le Levirite blessing or the Levitical, no, yeah, the Levitical blessing, interfaith things, they'll say, oh, or the threefold blessing. Okay, there's all kinds of things. If you look at the words, there's three, five, seven words, which are, isn't that how a ha haiku goes? No, haiku is five, anyway, whatever it is. Um, but there's all kinds of dimensions to it as well. Um, but it is very emotive. So we should remind ourselves that it's not the Cohen per se, with all due respect to our Cohen. Who is a very holy, righteous man? Mark sitting there. Um, Phil is very holy and righteous, of course. But nonetheless, <laughs> they're just a channel. Uh, they're just a channel. So even if you're not feeling, you know, if I came one day and said, I don't give a sermon because I'm, you know, today I don't really feel like I'm in a position to lecture anyone else. Say, tough. That's your job. <laughs> 
you are the conduit for, for that inspiration. So the cone is a conduit for blessings. That's it. Um, and I like Sally's idea that we have to have the visual, the visual reminder that, you know, yes, they're God's blessings, but they come through a physical manifestation. Pam. I've just seen a message from uh, Lisa asking a oh, question. Oh, sorry, right. No, there's just a question about... Oh, good yourself. question, right. Hi, yes. nice to see you, Lisa, and good luck at work. You work for the NHS, so good luck with that. Um, and thank you for what you do. Um, good question, right. Turning your back on the ark. So almost every shawl is built so that the rabbi, when he's giving a sermon, has his back to the ark. Um, we have a minhag custom in our shawl, which when I first came, I wondered about, and I asked around, and I was told it's a very proper and correct custom, that on Shabbos morning, a lot of shuls close the ark when the chazan starts leaving the duchen, the platform in front of the ark. That's called a duchen. Um, in our shul, you notice that what happens is that we close the ark before the chazan does Shema Yisrael. And the reason for that is, I understand, because mm -hmm. you're about to have your back to it. So because you have your back to it, we close it out of respect. So I guess having your back to a closed ark is slightly better than having it to an open ark. Look, it's the same as society, right? If you're talking to someone, you have your back to them. It's considered rude. So we try not to have our back to the Sifrei Torah. Now, when I give my sermons, I'm standing like that. Um, I know of a rabbi who, when people had weddings in the shul, would object to the keyboardist sitting in front of the ark um, with his back to the ark. I don't know if that's such an issue, if the ark's closed. Um, but it is something we're definitely mindful of and we should be aware of. So certainly trying to close it where appropriate, not leaving it open if you're kind of abandoning it. And just this idea. And by the way, also, um, you'll notice that other than the person carrying the Sefer Torah, many people, if they go up to the Ark, will, and when people go to the Kotel, they do this as well. And actually some people do this when they leave Shaw, will walk backwards, right? So you take your leave. Yeah. Uh, I think strictly speaking, you should do that. When you go up for Pasicha, really ideally, you should walk backwards. So it can be dangerous walking backwards, yeah? <laughs> So what a lot of people do, you'll notice, they do it at the Kotel, they do it when they leave Shaw, they do it when they go down from the Ark, is they'll do a couple of steps backwards to take their leave, and then they'll turn around. Yeah, I don't even know what I do consciously, I have to think about it. There's definitely something to be aware of. It's, I would say it's like teacher, kids standing for their teachers, you know. We're a bit more informal nowadays, but it, it does engender a sense of respect. When you consciously... a lot of time. Very interrupting. Oh, the kids standing up. Yes, it's all. all right. I hear you. I hear you. But but the root of it, which is the idea of respect. So the idea that I was um, in shul, I went into shul yeah. today. I forgot. I left a light on over Yomtev in case we decided to go in and dabble in the main shul. I left one light on, and I forgot to turn it off. So I went in last night to turn the light off, and I consciously thought to myself, I've just walked in. So there's another one, by the way, that you don't just use a shul as a thoroughfare. So you'll see sometimes people, if they walk into a shul or a base medrash, they'll sit down, and you'll hear them say a pasuk, a verse or two of Torah. So the classic one is Ashrei Yishrei Vesecha, because that's happy those who sit in your house. So I always learned, I try to remember, if you're just going to close the windows in shul, you sit down and you say a verse of Torah before you leave. So you're not abusing the respect of the shul. Um, so yesterday I went to close the windows and I consciously walked out backwards. I thought, you know, the least I can do, nobody else is in shul right now, um, show a bit of respect. Um, people, a lot of people do at the Kotel, you'll notice. They'll step backwards a bit and then turn around. Um, so that's how we also avoid having our back to the Ark and the Sifre Terror. But generally, yes, correct, we try not to. Oh, keep your hand up. Um, yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah, so this affects um, Iris, me, Brenda and Sally, because right. when we go to kiss the Torah. Yeah. When shul is open and we like to go and kiss the Torah <laughs> when the Ark's open, um, so, so should we really take a couple of steps backwards before oh, we go just... to our seats? Well, or could you just wait a minute? Yeah. We oh, yeah, we could wait. Back. We could. I don't know how this applies to women <laughs> because of the mechitza, <laughs> but I know how it applies to men. Um, strictly speaking, what you're really supposed to do, I believe, is accompany the Torah <gasps> to the bimmer and back to the ark. So when I was in New York, people would actually do that. They would go to kiss the Torah and they would continue to walk as part of the procession. Now, <laughs> it's not totally practical, but I believe, strictly speaking, that's what you're supposed to do. And that, by the way, is why the person who opens the ark, really, or for that matter, the rabbi, or anyone going up to the bimmer, right? When I go up for laying, if I'm not the one doing shachris, I follow the Sefer Torah. You accompany the Sefer Torah. So I would think the best thing to do is to go kiss it and not rush back to your place. If, if, if that works, um, I'm afraid it's probably going to be a while till we're actually kissing the Sefer Torah anyway. Mm. But even just, yeah, uh, people don't kiss it. They go up. 
if you can't reach it, the idea of bowing your head slightly or going up, yeah, you don't turn your back on it. So I think the correct thing to do would be to, to wait till the Torah goes by, basically, in that situation, whether you're kissing it or not. It doesn't do any harm. It's all respect, old fashioned respect. But when you bring the Torah to the women and the ark okay. is open, your back is to the ark because it has to be. And we that would be it. okay because you can't do ah. anything else. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I guess if you're, I mean, we do have our back to the ark at various times. You're right. When, we, when the Torah goes back, the ark gets opened and we're going around the shore and so on. Um, I mean, Kol Nidre, the ark's open the whole time, I think. Neila, the ark's open the whole time. Um, it's not It's not totally consistent. It's not, it's not, it's not totally consistent. It's, it's not totally consistent. It's not deliberate also. So I think, you know, someone standing in front of the ark, giving a sermon for some reason if the ark's open, but teaching Torah, I don't think is necessarily disrespectful. Um, by the way, another one, you're not supposed to have your back to a mace either. When I started in Cardiff, they used to, the Oha was kind of a triangular shape almost. I don't know if anyone's ever, Julian, you ever been there? No. No, okay. It was kind of triangular shape and the mace would be in the back, ready to go out. And there was a lectern in front of the coffin and people stood in front of the lectern. I thought, this can't be right. You have your back to the mace. You're actually supposed to address the person that's deceased in your eulogy. Um, and we changed it, we moved it to one side so that you were facing both the mace and the people. Again, respect. I don't know if that applies during Tahara and things like that, but it's respect. I mean, it's like, you know, does the teacher care that much if you stand for them? You know, does the mace really notice if you have your back to them? But it's, a certain, it's having a certain standard of respect, which is often missing nowadays, you know? And the schools that do those kind of things, as much time as it may, might waste, are probably the outstanding schools where the kids still have a sense of respect. I don't know, I can only speak for my boys, that they stand up for the teacher and all that kind of stuff. And yes, the boys are not always perfectly behaved in Hasma, but I definitely see the difference between some of the other schools my kids are in where that's all fallen by the wayside. Anyway, uh, Mark. Yeah, um, on a slightly different topic, my, my father wants to know, um, when he was a young boy in India, there, there was just yeah. a, a prayer for food. Like, like, Thank you for the food. And, right. and he... And, um, he's thinking that there that there was just one broca instead of like many brokers for like, like for the wine for the bread for the fruit. I've never heard there... that. I've never heard that. No. Um, I suppose no. it could make sense. Let's say you're teaching kids in Haida and their Hebrew is not so good that you might just treat, teach them broca of shahakol because that applies to anything. Um, I've never heard of that specifically. But you have listen. You have all kinds of things. There is a short benching. Mm. Right. One second. Right. One second. Eight words, which is mentioned in the Gemara. It goes like this. Brich, blessed be, Rachmana, the merciful one. Elokana, God. Malka, king, the Alma of the world. Mara, master, like owner, the high of this. Pita, pita doesn't mean pita bread, it means bread. Pita is bread in Aramaic. Right? As simple as you can get. Um, and no one's on birthright years ago with about 300 people on well, the rabbi has got them to do that benching after actually pizza as it happens. But um, we sometimes do it with our little kids because they can't learn the benching. So there might have been things that were taught to children, possibly. Um, but I've never heard of it sort of for adults. But I don't know. Could be. Different places have different traditions. Um, yes. Um, that's what I thought. That's what, that's what, that's what I thought. Um, um, I think I, I would have to speak to them. Um, um, Someone who comes from um, India, probably. Uh, Listen, I don't out. know every. I don't know every tradition and culture. It could be that oh. they had some kind of grace before meals that they would sit and say, oh, "Well, what we're about to receive, may the Lord make us grateful," or something to that effect, as well as brochas. I, I, I don't know. Anything's possible. Um, I'm apologies, oh. folks. I'm supposed to go on with the chief rabbi now, not just me personally. Oh, all the rabbis. Thank you. But very I'm going to. Thank you, Jeff. I'll give you a call after that. Okay, give you a call about twelve. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Great. Have All a good right, day, thanks. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. See you yeah. later. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Coming to the cookery. Yeah. Oh, to 